I think now we can start, exactly. Now we will start our festival officially with our first keynote. Hello, Dresden. Welcome from the future. Hello, Toby Walsh from Australia. I'm very happy to have you here with us. Toby Walsh is one of the leading researchers in artificial intelligence and a professor of artificial intelligence at the University in New South Wales and leads the algorithmic decision theory group at Data61. Australia's Center of Excellence for Information and Communications Technology. Toby, it's so great to have you here today, or let me say, your digital avatar from the future. But why did we travel into the year 2062? I, I really am talking to you from the future because I'm physically present in Sydney, Australia, where it's past midnight and it's already tomorrow. But I want to go beyond tomorrow to 2062 because that's when 300 of my colleagues, other experts in AI, predicted that machine intelligence would pass human intelligence. I should warn you that there was a lot of variability in their answers as to when machines would match human intelligence. But none of them predicted it would take just five or 10 years. Equally, few predicted it would take more than 100 years. 92% of them said it would occur sometime in the next century. It's something that might happen in our lifetimes and almost surely in the lifetime of our children. The year when machine intelligence matches human intelligence is going to be a really important moment in the history of human civilization. We weren't the strongest or the fastest animal. We got to where we were today because we were the smartest creature around. And yet sometime in the next century, we're almost surely set to be surpassed by machines. Machines that we ourselves made. Now, there are many reasons that computers are gonna be smarter than us. They can think faster than us. They never need forget anything. Oh, what was I saying? All right, computers never need forget anything. And they can work 24 seven, never needing to rest or eat or sleep. I think it would be terribly conceited that we were to say that we were as smart as you possibly could be. The history of science surely has taught us that we're not special. Copernicus taught us that the sun didn't go around the earth. We're not the center of the universe. Darwin taught us that we were little different to the apes. We're all descended from the same primitive life forms. We all share the same DNA. That leaves just one thing that might separate us from the other life on earth, our intelligence. But I'm sorry to tell you, there's nothing that special about human intelligence. Our intelligence is just one particular point on a long scale. And one day that point will be passed by machines. Human intelligence won't be passed today, despite everything you read in the newspapers, we still have a very long way to build machines that match human intelligence. The more that I study AI, the more respect I have for the human brain. The human brain is by far the most complex system we've come across in the whole universe. Nothing matches the complexity of its billions of neurons, its trillions of connections. The AI that we can build today is narrow AI. It can do one task, often very well. We can build a machine that plays chess better than the best grandmaster, that reads x-rays quicker and more accurately than any doctor, or translates English into German, nearly as well as the simultaneous translators that we have here today translating my speech. And let me just stop and thank those translators for their human intelligence. No, machines today don't match the full breadth of human intelligence, our adaptability, our emotional intelligence, our social intelligence, our creativity. Such artificial general intelligence or AGI is still some way off. But there aren't any laws of physics that we know of that will prevent us from one day 
building machines that match and likely surpass our human intelligence. And that's going to be a turning point in human history. We got to be the dominant species in charge of the planet because we were the smartest. Actually, at the moment, we don't seem to be doing a very smart job of managing the planet. You only have to consider the climate emergency or the decreasing bio biodiversity. I think it would be a very good thing if we had a bit more intelligence to help us run the planet. But everything you see around you today, this magnificent hologram, this museum, and everything in it is the product of human intelligence. We've done a lot despite being a rather puny ape. We've constructed the monumental pyramids at Giza, the sprawling Great Wall of China, the stunning Sagraya Familia. We've crossed the hottest deserts, climbed the highest mountains. We've even left the earth to walk on the moon. And we've created scientific theories that explain the mysteries of the universe from milliseconds before its birth, 13 billion years ago, till its eventual death, one Google year in the future. We've tamed far, eradicated smallpox, and soon I hope, got on top of COVID-19. Hang on in there, Germany, I feel for you. And we've created art so sublime it moves people to tears. The, the glorious melodies of Bach's and Matthew's passion, the naked beauty of Michelangelo's David, and the haunting sadness of the Taj Mahal. Can you imagine what even more marvelous things us humans will do with the help of the even greater intelligence of these artificially intelligent machines? This moment, the moment that machines match human intelligence is about a century or so in coming. It, it may seem to you like, like AI is an overnight success. Around um, 2016, my phone started ringing and it hasn't stopped. Journalists started to ring me up every day to try to understand the latest advances in AI. But AI started back in 1956. So it's taken 60 years then to be an overnight success. In the case of artificial intelligence, the subject started at a famous conference in Dartmouth College, New Hampshire, in the summer of 1956. Um, at that meeting, a group of researchers came together to kickstart research into AI. Of course, humans have been thinking of, about machines that think for thousands of years, at least as far back as the ancient Greeks and the invention of logic. But it took the invention of the computer around the time of the Second World War to give us the perfect machine in which to implement those models of thought. So back in 1956, John McCarthy, who I was lucky enough to know, assembled a motley crew of computer scientists, physicists, mathematicians, and economists in Dartmouth with the goal of building AI. And John even coined the term artificial intelligence to describe their ultimate scientific goal. He was a bit too optimistic about the scale of the problem. He famously predicted that the 10-person team assembled at Dartmouth College would take just two months to make significant progress on automating every aspect of human thought and learning. It's of course taking much longer than that. But by 2062, we might see John McCarthy's dream finally come true. So why is it here in 2021, where you are today, that we're starting to see the first results? Why is it that we're starting to see AI in the news every day? The reason that we're making good progress on building artificial intelligence is the story of four exponentials. Now, you hear a lot of nonsense about living in exponential times, but there are a couple of exponentials that we have been living with for the last few decades that have been helping us achieve this dream of building artificial intelligence. The first exponential is very famous. It even has a name, it's, it's Moore's Law. Moore's law is the doubling every two years or so of computer transistors. Roughly speaking, this translates into a doubling of computer power. And this has been gone, going on for over 60 years. Indeed, before even the invention of the transistor. The smartphones we have in our pockets today have more processing power than the primitive computers that took the Apollo astronauts to the moon and back 50 years ago. There are things that we dreamed about building even a decade ago that we can just now do because we have the processing power to do it. The second exponential is a similar doubling, again, every two years, of the amount of data we have. Those smartphones in your pocket, they're collecting all this data on us, sometimes sharing it with too many companies, but nevertheless a vital source of data. And many of the advances in AI are in a subfield of AI called machine learning, where we train computers with lots of data. And we now have much of that data online. 
The third exponential is a similar doubling, again, every two years, of the performance of the AI algorithms. Now, there's no reason that each of these four exponentials is doubling every two years. It's a nice coincidence, and it will make it easy for you to remember when you tell people about why AI is making waves today. So in any case, we're making really good progress on improving the basic algorithms, the deep learning methods, the transformers, the generative adversarial networks, and all the other algorithms we've been working on for the last 60 years. And the fourth and final exponential is again a doubling every two years. But it's, it's nothing to do with technology this time, uh, like the first three exponentials. It's to do with money. The amount of money being invested in the field has been doubling every two years. That's mean, that means more people are working on all these interesting problems. So you put all those four exponentials in the same pot, and it's a real recipe for making progress. Faster computers, better algorithms, more data on which to train, and more people to work on all of this. And while there has been some boom and bust in AI over the last 60 years, including a couple of AI winters where expectations didn't match up to success, we're surely at the peak of the AI cycle. I'm not concerned that we'll disappoint. There's a lot we can do that will be of immense economic value, even if we stop making any more scientific progress and just implemented what we've learned in the last few decades. One, one mistake people make is to think AI is one thing, it's not. At least today, AI is a collection of tools and techniques, just like our human intelligence is not one thing, but a collection of things. Artificial intelligence is a toolbox of techniques to perceive the world, to reason about the world, to act in the world, and then learn from that cycle of perception, reasoning, and action. Much of the progress we've been making recently in AI is in a subfield called machine learning. Much of your intelligence was learned. When you were born, you couldn't read, you couldn't write, you couldn't solve integral equations. Well, some of you probably still can't solve integral equations, but there are probably a few people in the audience who learned how to solve such equations and might even remember how to do so today. All of these things, learning, reading, writing, solving integral equations, were things you learned to do. Similarly, many of the things we get a computer to do today are things that the computer learned to do. Let me give you an example. In 2016, Google's AlphaGo computer program started to play the ancient Chinese game of Go better than any human. Now, to put Go in perspective, there are more possible games of chess than there are atoms in the universe. There are 10 to the 70 atoms in the universe. That's one followed by 70 zeros. But there are around 10 to the 120 possible games of chess. That's one followed by 120 zeros. And there are many, many more possible games to go, about 10 to the 174, in fact. That's one followed by 174 zeros, which is spectacularly large. To play chess, a computer can test out every possible interesting move, something not possible with the game of Go. Indeed, Go professionals have predicted that computers would never play Go as well as humans. How wrong they were. AlphaGo got to be good at Go like you or I would go about getting good at Go. It played a lot of Go. Practice makes perfect for computers, just like for humans. But the computer could play way more games of Go than a human could, even in a lifetime of playing Go. In fact, it played way more games of Go than if every one of you in the audience here today played Go from the moment you woke up to the moment you fell asleep for every day of your lives. The setup was simple. Two versions of the AlphaGo program played each other millions of times using dozens of computers in parallel. And at the end of each of these millions of games of Go, the AlphaGo program tweaked its weights. So in future, it could play more of the winning moves and less of the losing moves. Slowly but surely, it got better and better. Better first than the humans who wrote the code, and eventually better than Lisa Dole, 18 times world champion. Now, the most recent version of AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero, played the version that beat Lisa Dole back in 2016 and won 100-0. It's game over humanity, at least as far as playing the game of Go goes. The Chinese called the program a Go God as it plays such sublime Go. It plays moves that humans have never played in the 4,000 years we've been playing the game. But it's a very brittle intelligence. Change the rules of Go ever so slightly, and AlphaGo would fail miserably. Change Go from a normal 19 by 19 board to a 20 by 20 board, and Lee Stoll would be fine. 
but AlphaGo would have to start again and learn from scratch. That's just one of the many advantages we still retain for now over computers. But for how much longer? There's little doubt that artificial intelligence is already transforming our lives. A study by PwC in 2017 estimated that global GDP would be around 50% higher in 2030 in real terms as a result of AI. That would make it one of the largest opportunities for innovation in the next decade. You often hear about the AI race. However, it's wrong to think of this as a race with a single winner. There is, of course, the scientific race to build AI. And as with any scientific race, only the first get the credit. But the race to apply and develop AI is one that the whole planet can win. I think a good analogy is the race 100 years or so ago to develop and apply electricity. Now, it's true that people like Edison and Westinghouse received the initial patents, and it, it was their companies that uh, initially gained many of the economic benefits. But today, electricity is used by companies and individuals around the world, many of them here in Germany. All of us share the benefit of the electricity race. AI is going to be similar. It will be a pervasive technology like electricity in every home, office, and factory. And all of us can share the benefits. Now, it would be irresponsible of me not to identify the risks that AI pose alongside all those opportunities. These risks break down into three areas, economic risks, political risks, and societal risks. Now, concerns about the econo economic impact of AI have often focused on issues like employment and inequality. Will robots take away many jobs? Will AI increase the inequality that's already fracturing our society? AI will surely have a significant impact on employment as it takes over more and more tasks in the workplace. A famous and somewhat disputed 2013 study from the University of Oxford estimated that 47% of jobs in the US were at risk of automation. Now, such studies tend to ignore the many new jobs that AI will create or the, the working week that might shorten. But clearly some jobs like truck driver or warehouse worker are gonna be done by robots in the very near future. And we need to prepare for this. In addition to those economic risks, there are significant political risks. Our democratic institutions around the world are under siege. Trust in politicians and the political process is at an all time low. And technologies like AI appear to be amplifying these changes. We see AI, for instance, being used to micro target voters as well as to generate deep fakes and fake news. Technology companies are rightly under increasing pressure to address misinformation and polarization on their platforms. And finally, there are significant societal risks. Novelists like Orwell and Huxley have painted pictures of dystopian futures, and it's becoming apparent technologies like AI could take us towards that. AI-driven face recognition software can, for example, be used to surveil and oppress populations on an unprecedented scale. AI could impact on many other human rights, even the right to life if we see AI being used on the battlefield to decide who lives and who dies. So we can't sit on our hands and ignore the coming changes. And we should, of course, learn from history. This is not the first technology to disrupt the way we live. The Industrial Revolution saw jobs shift into factories, populations increase, but so did the quality of people's lives. Life expectancy here in Germany nearly doubled. But the most important changes weren't technological, but societal. We made some large structural changes to the way we ran society to deal with the technological disruption of the steam and electricity. We introduced universal education so where people were educated for the new jobs, unions and labor laws to protect the rights of the workers in these factories, and welfare and pensions to spread some of that prosperity. We're going through a similar disruptive period now driven by technologies like AI. This will again transform how we live. And once more, the most significant changes are likely to be technological, not to be technological, but societal. We must think about structural changes necessary just to, not just to weather this transformation, but to prosper. Now, like, while technologies like myself can inform the conversation as to possible capabilities and the likely limitations of these coming AI systems, the conversation needs to be much broader. There are many questions we need to think about. What decisions can we hand over to machines? Can machines behave ethically? Will those intelligent machines become conscious? 
what does artificial intelligence tell us about one of the least understood scientific questions of today, the nature of our own human intelligence? These conversations need to move out of Sil Silicon Valley and into the public arena. Technologies like AI can help us build a better future, but technology is not destiny. We need to choose wisely today about how we build that future. Thank you. And now I'm going to come back to you in 2021 for a Q&A session. Hello, Toby. Thank you so much for this. I must say it is quite an experience to share this stage with a hologram. Definitely a first one for me too. So we have been traveling with you into the year 2062, but you haven't told us exactly how our everyday life could look like. Do we have a lot of time for ourselves, for instance, because machines will do our work Will we have fully immersed ourselves and live in the metaverse? Will we be surrounded by digital allies and friends instead of real humans? <laughs> Those are great questions. I, I do think we will have more time. Uh, again, we should learn from the, the, the industrial, industrial revolution was the cause of the weekend. The, there's no reason about the earth going around the sun that we get two days off every seven. That was a product of the time that the machines gave us back then. And the robots will hopefully das, do more jetzt, of the work. Die, and if we can fix the distribution problem of how we yeah, split so that that so around, so then we can spend more time with our families, with our friends, also, with our communities, making art, doing the things that are important. Ja alle so, I always say to people, the, the only truly obscene yes, four-letter word is work. Thank you, Toby. Hello. So we also want to give all of you here in Dresden and online the opportunity to get in dialogue with Toby Walsh. If someone of you here in the audience has a question for Toby, please raise your hand and my colleague Hendrik will come to you with a microphone. For the online audience, please write your questions in the chat and my colleague Vincent, he sits over there, can relay them to Toby. Toby, meanwhile, I have one more direct follow-up question for you based on the future vision you just shared. How could we create an AI that benefits all humanity? How can we ensure that these powerful machines will act responsibly in the future? And how can we create the accountability needed for it? Is this mainly on governments to set regulation? Should tech companies self-regulate or is it on the consumers and users to do so? That's, that's another great and really important question. And I think it is res the responsibility of all of those actors. It's not, we can't just sit and let government do it. We have to have a certain responsibility ourselves. And again, we saw that with the Industrial Revolution. We, workers actually stood up for their rights and stood up to, to demands to share some of those benefits. And then we need to do the same again. We need to take certain responsibility ourselves for the uses of our data. And we need to demand that the tech companies behave perhaps a bit more responsibly than they have in the past. Um, but it's important to remember, as I said, that technology is not destiny. The future is the product of the decisions we make today and the choices we make today. There are many possible futures, some of them dystopian and some of them utopian. And it's up to us to make the wise choices. And of course, we have to look to Glasgow today to say, are we making the right wise choices so that our children do inherit a better world? Thank you, Toby. So is there a first question from the online audience, Vincent? Indeed, there is one question that just came in. 
Um, I will translate it in a second. Thank you. Are there already international um, regulation institutions? And this question is from Jana Binder, also from the Goethe Institute. Uh, institutions who, which are um, also, who have also agreed on um, global standards, for example, for um, the implementation of um, autonomous weapons. Did you get the question, Toby? Huh. I did, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, there, there are ongoing discussions at the United Nations, uh, and I've been privileged to, to speak at the United Nations at those discussions. And there's a really important meeting um, hap happening very shortly at the United Nations, the review conference, uh, where it will be decided if we should start the process of building regulations to limit uh, the use of lethal autonomous weapons, whether we will demand that there's always meaningful human control. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll make the right choice there, um, that we will decide that the machine should not choose who lives and who dies. But everything is still to play for. Um, and so if you have um, the voice of politicians here in Germany or elsewhere, I. I ask that you press their ear and remind them what uh, recent Ipsos survey says, which is the majority of people around the world in countries around the world are against the idea. It will look like Hollywood movies. It will look like the Terminator movie. It will take us to a very dystopian world if we let the machines do the killing. Thank you very much, Toby. Thanks to Australia. and. Is there any question from the audience here in Dresden? So please raise your hand if so. Yeah. Um, okay, so thanks for your um, speech in the beginning. Um, you were saying that um, you think that conversations about AI need to move out of the Silicon Valley and well, go somewhere else, I guess. Um, so, um, and you, then you were also saying that um, we as civil society and individuals need to take more responsibility. So I was wondering, um, how exactly do you actually imagine um, participation of the civil society in the development um, of AI? Could you name, like, what would be a good model for you? And could you maybe name some of the good examples that you might know? Thank you. So the question was how uh, participation of civil society in the yeah, dialogue about AI could happen. What could be a good way to initiate this? It has, needs to happen at every level. It has to begin in the morning when you open your smartphone and the choices you make. Uh, you, you have to realize that when you click those buttons and give consent to Facebook or someone else to use your data, you are helping to perpetuate that misuse of the technology. And so we do have a personal responsibility to make sure that we use the technology wisely and then to bring to bring, bring things together to, to form pressure groups uh, to vote for the politicians who are going to do the right thing in our in our in our name I mean we, we forget that is actually in some sense the, the most important a part of the democratic process is the day that you go and put your vote in the ballot box um, that is when we choose the politicians who represent our views and um, we'll put um, regulation where appropriate on the tech companies. And it is worth pointing out that I think Europe is leading the way. We are seeing at the moment um, greater privacies that have been given to us, given back to us because of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation Act. And there is a very vigorous and healthy debate going on within the European uh, Parliament and the, um, around the, the new um, AI Act that's um, being developed as we speak. So, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we will take back suitable control. There was a, a time where we thought you couldn't and you shouldn't regulate the digital space. And now we realize that you can and you should, and that it is actually beneficial for innovation as well as for our human rights. Thank you. Did this answer your question or would you like to add something? Are there other questions maybe from the online audience first? 
Hello. Yes, indeed, Janet. I would like to combine two questions, one from Mike and one from Georg, which is about the concept of intelligence and also the competition that is going to probably going to happen or is foreseeable between humans and machines. How can we avoid that artificial intelligence doesn't become, doesn't consider us as uh, a threat, the biggest threat, and therefore starts fighting us as a first one? And the second one is if we consider there, uh, that um, machines will become very intelligent. What do we exactly mean with intelligence? Which competencies or skills do we understand under that concept? And how can we compare um, the human intelligence with the artificial intelligence? Is it okay, Toby? Did you get the questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh I somehow wish that we hadn't called artificial intelligence artificial intelligence because we don't really know what our intelligence is. It's, it's very hard to define what human intelligence is. It's not the thing that IQ tests measure. We know that there are lots of cultural and other biases in an IQ test. So it's not intelligence is not something you can put on a scale and you can, you can put very smart people here and less smart people here. It's a very multi-dimensional thing. There are many different aspects to intelligence. Um, and the same is going to be true of the intelligence that we build into machines. But it's worth pointing out that it doesn't have, machines don't have our emotional intelligence today, at least, and they don't have our social intelligence. Um, it may be that they never have that emotional or social intelligence. I mean, they, we know that they won't have emotions because emotions are chemical. And, and Computers are electrical devices, they're not chemical devices. We can give them perhaps fake emotions, and that may be useful, that may make them more attractive to interact with. But um, are those fake emotions gonna be the same as real emotions? Machines are not gonna have our mortality. Machines are not gonna be worried about dying. They won't. So there are many mortal and human concerns that won't trouble the machines. Um, so it, it may be that, they, that it's a very different type of intelligence. Um, the analogy I often like to give to people is, is Spock. It, it may be a very rational, unemotional form of intelligence. Um, my colleague, uh, David Chalmers, has called it zombie intelligence. It, in, incredibly smart, but lacking in all the emotions that we have. Um, or maybe we do give them fake emotions and they're as good as the real thing. We don't know. That's going to be interesting. As to the second question, the, the question of how can we be sure that the machines are benevolent to us or that they're, they're not going to want to destroy us and, and be competitive with us? I think that's, first of all, it's a, it's, a very, it's a very male idea of intelligence to think that there's something to do with domination and that with great wisdom and intelligence that doesn't come uh, a respect for all life and so that they should hopefully respect us like we in our finer moments respect the other lives other life forms on the planet we respect the whales and the dolphins and even even the insects and we realize the importance of them for our own existence and that we are only guardians and custodians of the planet and we have a duty to, to look after it for all of the life on the planet. So hopefully um, it will be like that and, and that the, they see that it's in their interest as much as our interest. And then it's the final observation is that, is that at the moment, and it's hard to imagine anything other than this, machines do what we ask them to do. They don't have desires of their own. They only do what we tell them to do. We have to be very careful to think, work out, those are the right goals, um, but they don't go off and do things that we haven't told them to do. They are, um, in many respects, our servants, maybe very smart servants, but, but they do only and what we tell them to do. Thank you very much. I always like the idea to think uh, about AI and then come up what makes us human, to think about uh, what's the difference between machines and humans at the end. And for this, I have a question regarding crea creativity. So you mentioned the play uh, Go. 
and there was one a famous match against Lisa Doll and the machine won. And some of the experts came up and said, uh, this is a kind of creative move. So can a machine become creative in your eyes? That is a fantastic question. It's a, it's a question actually that's haunted the field ever since it began. Indeed, in, before artificial began, a, Ada Lovelace, the very first computer programmer back in the 18th century who was working with Charles Babbage, who was building what was the very first perhaps mechanical computer, put forward that very idea. She said that computers only do what we tell them to do. They, they aren't ever going to be creative. And that's a question, a philosophical question that has haunted the field ever since. Will, will machines, is creativity that something only humans have, that machines will never have? It, I, personally, I actually do believe that machines could be potentially creative. There are things that you can do you, to make yourself more creative. There are the tricks you can teach yourself, the books you can read, and they're the sort of things you can imagine giving to machines. And indeed, we're already, there are already some examples of this. There, there are paintings that have been sold in Sotheby's for hundreds of thousands of dollars that were painted by a computer. There are poems that have been written, not very good poems, I must admit, that have been written by a computer. And we've, I've personally worked on computer programs that have invented new mathematics, the mathematicians thought were interesting. So, I see no fundamental reason why machines couldn't put knowledge together in new ways, just like we do. And as you mentioned, there was that famous game of Go where they, the computer did make a move, it played on the fourth row, and humans had never played in 4,000 years of playing game Go. We'd, humans had never thought that that was a good move, and it turned out to be a very good move. So I'm, I'm very um, optimistic that machines will be ways of amplifying human creativity and that we will use them like tools as, as, uh, to not only to amplify our intelligence, but to amplify our creativity. Thank you. I know that we have some artists in our audience as well, so maybe you have another opinion. If so, raise your hand and my colleague uh, Hendrik will come to you with a microphone. But I think there has been a question here in the first row as well. Thanks a whole lot, Toby, for your very inspiring talk. And if I got you right, uh, then you don't assume that machines can develop anything like conscience. And I'm asking myself whether it doesn't make any sense to define intelligence without the concept of conscience. Because, for example, if you define it as problem-solving capacity, intelligence, where is the problem without conscience? So do you think, actually, that machines can develop conscience? So the questions from that, the audience. That's another, yes. Yeah, that's it? another fa fantastic question. It seems pretty clear today that machines don't have consciousness. As, 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 as far as we can tell, machines are not conscious. But the problem is that consciousness is probably the least understood idea out there. It's one of the greatest remaining scientific questions. What is consciousness? Why is it? That when you wake up in the morning, you open your eyes and you're suddenly conscious, you're aware of your existence. It's more fundamental to your experience of life than your intelligence. It's not, you, you wake up in the morning, you don't think, oh, I'm intelligent. You wake up, you think, I'm conscious, I'm awake, I'm aware of the world around me, seeing everything. And the richness of life comes from us, our awareness, our consciousness of everything around us. And so it's going to be very interesting whether we build machines with consciousness. There's three ways it could happen, as far as I can see. One is the, that we program it explicitly. That's pretty hard because we don't know what it is. It's very hard to program something that we don't know what it is. So I don't really see us getting to conscious machines that way. Another way is that it is a emergent phenomenon that um, we know that the more complex the brain, the more conscious it tends to be, that we're more conscious than probably the ants that we see scurrying around the floor, and we've got more complex brains. So it may be something that emerges out of the complexity of the machines that we're building. That's possible, and we may build more and more complex machines eventually, 
we discover that they're conscious. And then the third possible way is it's something that's learned. And that's certainly true of human consciousness. When we're born, we're not particularly conscious of our surroundings. It's that wonderful moment when your child discovers that they have toes and that they're their toes and not someone else's toes and they start wriggling them and become aware that they are an actor in the in the bigger world. So maybe it's something that machines also learn, become more and more conscious as we give them more and more learning. Um, or it may be that machines never become conscious and, and consciousness is something that was restricted to biology and it can't be something that you can ever create in silica. And then we come back to you know, what I said before, the, the zombie intelligence, maybe it is, they could be very smart, but lack consciousness. Um, Certainly, if they lack consciousness, maybe they're not going to be as smart as us. Thank you, Toby. One song. Do we have another online question? I have actually quite a lot of online questions. Thank you, Toby. A lot of questions are raising the subjects of philosophical subjects of consciousness, of ability of um, getting to emotions. You already have given a couple of answers on that topic. So I would like to sum it up because I think we are reaching the end of the Q&A time um, in asking, um, do you think that with a huge process in AI, people working with AI slash machine learning slash data science should have some kind of Hippocratic oath to ensure that people creating new AI solutions will be creating ethical, transparent and fair solutions? Before you answer, Toby, thank you very much to our digital audiences for reaching numerously via the chat. We will continue working that way. Toby, the mic. As I work on being used to benefit all of us um, and to make good choices, but, but equally, there's only there's a, a limit to what we can do as, as engineers, as, as scientists. Uh, we, uh, I, we publish our work in the open literature. I remember a very sad moment when, uh, when someone came up to me at one of the very first conferences I ever presented my work at, and they said, oh, we implemented your algorithm. And I said, oh, that, and I looked at his badge and it was someone who worked at Talus, which is a French defense company and a little bit of my heart sank and I asked him what it was and it was for a missile defense system. And nothing I could do about that because I published the algorithm in the open literature. The only thing that consoled my, my consciousness was that it was, it was a defense system, not an offense system that was being used to schedule the missiles. Um, so we have to remember that AI is a, a dual use technology the same algorithms that we work on that are going to track pedestrians and go into autonomous cars and make the roads far safer are going to go into those autonomous weapons that we've been worrying about and track targets and then kill those people. And there's nothing that we can do about that other than demand uh, that um, the, the UN, for example, regulates the use and misuse of these, of these technologies. That, that AI is a, is a force for good and for bad. And we, we want to make sure that we get mostly good and very little of the bad. So our time is almost up, but before we let you go, I have one last question for you. You pointed out that AI um, could tell us about one of the least understood scientific questions today, the nature of our own human intelligence. In addition, it can tell us a lot about the society we live in because AI is always a kind of mirror as the machines are learning with historic data. Can AI give us also the chance to think about the world we want to live in instead? And can we use all the upcoming questions related to AI these days to rethink society in total? I hope we do. I hope we seize this moment. I, this is a moment of change uh, because of the climate, because of the pandemic, and because of technologies like AI that do permit us to change, to think about how we run our society. What is the nature of work? How, how, do, we, how do we share the prosperity, the technology, the bounty that technology brings to us? 
And so I think it's really important that we have conversations like the one that we have here tonight uh, and, and throughout the rest of this festival about what sort of future it should be. Because the future is, uh, there's everything to play for. Um, and so it's up to us to make the wise choices, like, like we made at the end of the Second World War, to, to build the society that we saw then. And I think we have, we will look back, historians will look back at this moment in time as one of those moments where we got to choose what sort of future it was going to be. Thank you very much for this advice, Toby. We really want to thank you for getting up in the middle of the night in Australia. How late is this for you right now? It's three o'clock in the morning. It's three o'clock in the morning yeah, and tomorrow. So it's extraordinary that you are with us here. And uh, this is your applause. Thank you. It was great meeting your uh, digital avatar. And this was Toby Walsh on our festival stage and the start of a hopefully wonderful AI festival.